Gentry and Hadley Eddings met, fell in love, and married in an all-American storybook manner. Surrounded by family and friends, and with dreams and visions of lifelong happiness, as loving parents to loving children. Faithful in the calling to a life of Christian ministry, Gentry became a worship leader at Forest Hill Church, one of Charlotte, North Carolina's most prominent churches. It wasn't long before their dream of becoming parents became a beautiful reality. With a wonderful marriage, a beautiful toddler, and the expectancy of another baby about to be born, the unthinkable happened. crash in Pender County left the community heartbroken. Killer Had rear-ended Hadley's vehicle and just after noon. Seen a truck Morrison. plowed into their car, killing their toddler and forced Hadley, who was eight months pregnant, into labor. So I turned back and I just rubbed his little foot and I said, I love you, buddy. And then the next thing I knew was just kind of a blur. I was bracing myself. And I was, it was just very slow motion. One of the first things he said was, Dobbs is in the arms of Jesus. In the midst of the pain and sorrow of the ultimate calamity, in a tragedy that garnered international attention as well as an overwhelming outpouring of love and sympathy, Gentry and Hadley make an unprecedented decision. They choose to forgive the man behind the wheel of the vehicle that took their children from them. I felt prompted by the Spirit to say a word about forgiveness. God has forgiven us and so he calls us to forgive others. Theirs is not a story about tragedy. Theirs is a story of faith, courage, forgiveness, and God's unwavering faithfulness and restoration. It's a typical Saturday morning for Gentry and Hadley Eddings. The quiet calm of their South Carolina home, along with pictures of their sons, Dobbs and Reed, bear witness to the darkest moments that they, as a young couple, could ever have endured. And yet, the same silence simmers with an atmosphere of anticipation, of excitement, of restoration. I met this girl named Brooke, and we became really great friends. We sang in the choir, we did Sunday school, did a lot of stuff together. Well, she had a brother named Gentry. <laughs> and we hadn't really talked about like her setting us up or anything like that. Um, but one day he came down with his dad from Charlotte to our church and we were having like a special Sunday of just like testimonies and worship music. And um, so I was giving my testimony about um, just that first year of college. Met him. I was sitting in the pews, and I didn't know it at the time, but uh, my dad and sister had invited me down for this Sunday worship service so that I would meet Hadley. Uh, <laughs> and I remembered that they had mentioned there's this girl Hadley, and I remembered that while I was sitting in the pews waiting for the service to start. So I started looking around going, you know, where is this girl? Uh, and then and the pastor said, we're going to invite Hadley up to give her testimony. and. Her story was just like mine, uh, of how God worked in her life, and I was like, wow, she's beautiful, she loves the Lord, I think this is a good girl to go, you know, go after and pursue you. <laughs> so, you know, I was excited to meet her after the service, and they ended up having a church picnic that day, um, and we got to sit near each other and chat a little bit and get to know each other. And um, when she left, we gave each other a high five, and I was like, yes, a high five. Uh, and I left with my dad and went back to Charlotte with a huge grin on my face. And my dad was like, why are you smiling so much? I was like, I'm in a good mood, I don't know. Probably like within that week after that church service, I got a message on Facebook from him. And it was like, hey, you know, my friends and I are coming to Columbia to go to the zoo. We'd love for you to come with us and to go out to lunch. And I was kind of like, what? This is weird. This is my best friend's brother. Like, um, I kind of typed back, like, maybe I could meet for lunch. Can't go to the zoo. Sorry, you know. And he just, I guess I'm really bad at saying no. Because <laughs> he asked again, I think, like, said, well, come on, you should just go to the zoo with us. And I somehow said yes. I, I still don't know how it worked <laughs> out. I'm just glad it did. Yeah. And then so he picked me up, we went to the zoo, and that was pretty much it. I mean, from then on, nine months later, we were engaged, and 
Yeah. Yeah. Fast track. <laughs> On May 23rd of 2009, Gentry and Hadley were married in the southern town of Spring Valley, a town located on the outskirts of Columbia, South Carolina. The same church where I met Hadley um, is where we got married, mm -hmm. Spring Valley Baptist in Spring Valley outside of Columbia. Mm -hmm. Well, Gentry was one of those remarkably thoughtful, warm, engaging people who didn't have an enemy anywhere. And so when he and Hadley got married, they just seemed like almost the perfect couple because she was equally warm and engaging and they were greatly accepted by everybody here at the Forest Hill Church immediately. 2009, May 23rd, 2009, we got married. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she looks me. beautiful. Uh, thanks. In the spring of 2010, Gentry and Hadley moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, when Gentry was hired as a full-time worship leader for Forest Hill Church, one of Charlotte's most prominent churches. Gentry started out at the Rock Hill campus leading worship there and was loved yeah. by the people. Uh, then there came an opportunity for him to move to the South Park campus right. and lead worship there as well. And he did that for a couple of years. Then we started the Ballantyne campus and needed a worship leader there and uh, moved him there as uh, its leader. Well, I sing and I um, was moving here to Charlotte um, after I'd gotten married. And of course I wanted to be invested in a church and um, more importantly on the worship team. And so Gentry was my contact when we started going to um, Forest Hill. And I'll never forget, I had to go in and do my audition with him to be a part of the worship team. And I just, the minute I saw Gentry, there was just something about him um, that wasn't like any other man of God that I'd had the opportunity to meet. I just knew there was something special, and I didn't really know what that was, but, um, but it was a good, holy special, if you will. Now his greatest gift as a worship leader was his sincerity, his authenticity. Um, he had a deep faith. Everybody saw that. It was real, meaningful, informative. But what made him so attractive was the way he led worship was just who he was. Mm -hmm. And people felt that. They were drawn to him, attracted mm -hmm. to him as a person, even beyond him just being a good worship leader. Hadley, I met her through being on the worship team. And um, we just became really great friends, um, some unique qualities about Hadley is she is, um, she's just so sweet and understanding and caring. Um, I've never heard her say a bad or negative thing about anyone, even in moments where I am venting about someone. She always, always turns it back to the positive and gives me a different perspective, but just in this approachable, loving, non-judgmental way. And, um, She's just been an amazing friend to walk through life with, with those kinds of qualities. Settled into married life and with a dream job, the happy couple started to revisit their dreams of being parents. If someone asked me when I was growing up what I wanted to be, I wanted to be a wife and a mom. <laughs> so I always knew like I wanted to, to have children and he wanted to have kids. Um, but we had said when we first got married, like let's wait about five years. We were really young when we got married. We were 21 and 22, so we felt like we had some time. Um, you know what we did? A couple years in, we started to toy around with the idea, mm -hmm. and we said, okay, we'll get a dog. <laughs> and we'll, we'll just start with that and see how that goes. And we got Addie, and she was such a good dog <laughs> that it didn't, we, we were supposed to buy us at least another year right? in a way. But it was... Three months later, we got pregnant. Yeah, three, three <laughs> months in, and we say it was just because she was such a good dog. <laughs> yeah. She didn't make it hard enough for us. Yeah. <laughs> Hadley was a preschool teacher um, even before children and gentry. I mean, they're just, 
Together they're so united in, um, in Christ, in how they think, and how they respond. And you know, as children today and parents today, we need that Christ-centered um, stability. Um, I think that's one thing that children today are lacking. So Gentry and Hadley are, if you open up the dictionary, <laughs> there they are. I mean, um, they, they are madly in love with each other. They're madly in love with Christ. They're madly in love with kids. They are more than qualified and equipped to lead and direct a child um, to be the best that God would call that child to be. The pregnancy wasn't bad and um, we were just kind of expecting to like go with the flow, I think. It's, you know, there's a mystery to it. Yeah. You're, you're kind of <laughs> wondering, how's this going to go? Going in blind a little bit. Uh, excited, know. a little nervous. How do we, how are we going to be parents? Well, Gentry has a great dad. Uh, mm -hmm. Gentry Sr., yeah. who's just a wonderful dad to him. And around yeah. these parts, uh, those of us who've gotten to know uh, Gentry <laughs> Sr., Big G, Big G, as he is affectionately <laughs> called, um, knew that Gentry was loved by his dad, loved his dad in return, and would give that same love to his Boys. kids yeah. as well. Just a few years into their marriage, Gentry and Hadley were blessed with their first son, Dobbs. Bright and beautiful days, this worship leader and his loving wife were living their collective dream. Dobbs' first two years were nothing short of blissful for Gentry and Hadley. Joy. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. so much joy. He was just a blast. He was fun. He was joyful. He talked so much. Um, to be two, you know. He just liked to play. Right. Uh, he was an easy, easy yeah. kid. Yeah, I enjoyed especially being a dad, the, um, you know, fun of, of just the, the bond between father and son, you know, Star Wars. We, I mean, we watched all three of the original Star Wars <laughs> movies together, and, you know, he would sing the Star Wars theme song in the car, you know, and just kind of just enjoying boy stuff together, yeah. you know, Transformers and Lion King. Lion King and They just had a really sweet sensation of joy, like, wow, this is this is ours. This is what we get to mold um, and and lead and guide. And um, they were just so precious in how they did that. Um, and Hadley was the preschool teacher, so she had little Dauber do at preschool with her. Gentry was still leading worship. And they just were really, it was like they were complete, you know? They were just this sweet little family. They were so proud of him, and he was so special. So, so special. Fun, Joy. My mom used to always say, that kid's middle name should be Joy. <laughs> he just was bright, bright light. When Dobbs was born and Gentry began to love him as a dad, we went, man, that kid's going to be one loved child. Well, and that household was also full of music, as you can imagine, with Gentry and Hadley both being musical. So then Dobbsy became musical and they would sing songs and it, I think it was just music just pervaded everything about them. I want two, I want two, three, four. Becoming parents proved to be everything that they had both hoped for. Even at the tender age of two, Hadley and Gentry began teaching Dobbs about the Bible, about Jesus, about faith. Yeah, it was really important for us to make sure that Dobbs knew who God was, who Jesus was. You know, it's such an important thing in our lives and, you know, it's kind of I mean, you know, we we work for the church. That's what we do. We were both raised um, in um, families who love the Lord. So it's really important for us to start that early with him. Um, Dobbs was at church every Sunday morning. He was in the aisles, raising his hands, singing with his daddy, dancing. And um, it was just so much to just fall in love with. We would read Bible stories to him. Um, we would sing him songs, like the songs that we sang him to bed every night. We sang How Great Thou Art and Tis So Sweet. So smart. Um, and just really at an early age was singing worship songs that four-year-olds or five-year-olds should be singing. But he knew the lyrics. He liked the drums. He liked the guitar. I mean, he was 100% both Hadley and Gentry. How great thou art. 
and obviously with Gentry being a worship leader, he knew all of the worship songs. <laughs> Sometimes we didn't realize that he knew them all, but he did. Gentry were, and Hadley were just so full in that new season of life. Just for being two years old, he just had such a strong connection with the Lord. Um, there are several times I can remember just kind of looking at him like, wow. I remember one time we were, when we were moving from our house in Rock Hill to Indian Land, we were kind of having a stressful day and this song came on the radio and we looked over and Dobbs had his hands up and his eyes closed. And both of us began to just kind of cry because we were all stressed out and here's our little boy just kind of worshiping the Lord. In 2014, Hadley and Gentry prepared to welcome a second baby into the world. He was to be named Reed. A tender excitement filled their hearts at the thought of Dobbs being a big brother to baby Reed. The pregnancy was promising, and soon the new addition to their numbers would have made them a family of four. We were overjoyed to find out that Hadley was pregnant again. Again, they fell into parenthood so naturally. And then the second child, uh, it just it seemed to be the next natural addition to the family, learned he was a boy, and now Dobbs would have a brother. It just seemed like everything was advancing in a perfect way according to God's plan for their lives. In May of 2015, during these blissful days, Gentry was invited to officiate the wedding of his sister. The wedding was to take place in Wilmington, North Carolina. Dobbs had a huge part of our engagement, actually. Stuart is my husband, and I knew that we were going to go that route and get married, but I just wasn't sure of when it was gonna happen, and we were taking family pictures, which we often did, and that was not anything out of the norm, and um, we were taking pictures of Stuart and I. We had just taken pictures of Gentry and Hadley and Dobbs, and now it was time to take pictures of Stuart and I, and Dobbs walked up to us where we were and handed Stuart the ring box and I lost it when I saw Dobbs with this little ring box um, handing it to Stuart and he asked me to marry him and Dobbs kept saying I marry you marry I marry you Burber you marry which was just great and he was so excited. He loves Stu Stu is what he would call him. The first thing we thought of, we knew we wanted our family to be a part of it. Um, my whole family was there when we got engaged. We knew that they would all be there the day we got married and we thought it would be a memorable moment to have him be the one to marry us. So there was no question. If, if it was a way to make it happen, we asked him and he said, I will do whatever I can to make that happen and we were blessed to have him do it and us be our first wedding that he officiated. I had a really happy experience with Hadley in that we were both pregnant with our second child um, at the same time and our kids were going to be close together in age. My, my kids were going to be 15 months apart and um, Dobbs and Reed were going to be 18, 20 months apart. And so we always, um, you know, picked on each other like, oh my gosh, are we going to be able to handle this? They're going to have two toddlers. What are we going to do? So Ava was born in April. Reed was set to be born in June. Um, and then we, the wedding was in May. So we had three months there. So Ava was born, wedding was coming up. Hadley was gonna get home, Reed was gonna get here, and life was just gonna get fabulous, right? Hadley came over before she left for the wedding. She saw the baby. Um, Gentry had even brought Dobbs over. Um, I went upstairs to bathe my oldest and I could hear um, Gentry singing to Ava. Jesus loves the little children. Um, so um, Dobbs and Gentry were down there singing. Me and Hadley were upstairs bathing the kids together. And um, they all left. And then um, they, had to the, they headed to the beach in May. Gentry was down at the beach with Hadley to do his sister's wedding. They were getting married at a very beautiful spot on the beach. I was honestly a little bit nervous about doing all that part, but it went well. It was supposed to rain on the day that we were getting married. Um, God just prepared all the details of that day. I woke up on my wedding day and looked outside and the skies were blue. Um, a big hazard that we thought was gonna obstruct the, the wedding venue was completely gone and covered miraculously in sand. Um, the day was perfect. Just being together as a family that day, 
Um, it was, I, I just remember stopping at some point and feeling like I've never felt this close to God in heaven and just today, something special about today. It was like God had reached down just to give us a big hug. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. We now recognize you as husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. If I could describe in my mind what heaven was, it was that day. Yeah. We had spent the whole morning and the afternoon pretty much getting the house ready for the wedding because we had it at the beach house we were staying at. And so we were a little bit busy. He had been kind of with his dad helping with the kids. I had been helping with my sister-in-law's get um, the house decorated. So when it came down time to getting ready, we had about 30 minutes. Um, take showers, get dressed, you know, get Dobbs ready. So we were a little bit stressed out, um, kind of in our bedroom, just all going crazy um, and getting a little bit snappy with each other, um, mm -hmm. just out of stress, I think. And, and in those moments, Dobbs just looked at us and said, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 4610. <laughs> and it was amazing because I distinctly remember Hadley was kind of in the bathroom and I was walking back and forth across the room and I just remembered kind of that feeling of one thing to the next, one thing to the next. And Dobbs was standing in the middle of the room. He was physically still. And as I was kind of going one thing to the next, talking to Hadley is when he said that. And it just kind of stopped everything all at once. And I just remember being like, wow, he, you know, that is profound that this two-year-old, my son, is saying that right now. You right, know? and we had taught him the verse um, probably in the like a few months leading up towards that. I mean, it's been about six months because I remember he was saying it at Christmas, um, but it was normally for like, okay, show everybody your Bible verse or here's a piece of candy to your Bible verse. So this time was completely unprompted. Yeah. On the day after the wedding, tragedy would strike. In a single moment, a deadly accident would impact their lives forever. The next morning after the wedding, we packed everything up to head home. We were kind of in a rush to get out of the house. We got all the cars loaded up and we were in a big caravan heading back to Charlotte. Had just gotten back on the road after lunch. I remember putting Dobbs in his car seat and just kind of um, you know, making sure he was safe and secure and just Hadley was in the car with him. They were in one vehicle and I was by myself in another car. And we started the caravan again and we weren't five minutes on the road. I was listening to my worship songs because it was Saturday and I needed to get ready to lead worship the, the next day for church when I got back to Charlotte. We come to stop at a red light and I remember braking behind Hadley and right, right just as my car came to a stop, I glanced at the rear view mirror and saw the front of the truck. It was red and um, I just had split seconds of knowing that that car was coming at me and it wasn't gonna stop. You know, like a bullet smacked into the back of my car and my car rolled a couple times. And the whole time, just out of just wondering what is happening, you know, it's just you're, you're, you're not understanding because it's mm -hmm. happening so fast. Quickly, you come to realize I've been hit by a car and I'm rolling. And I remember the car rolled several times and ended up upside down. I remember thinking, okay, I was hit, I was at the back, so hopefully I was the only one hit. And when the car came to a stop, I didn't know if I had been pushed into oncoming traffic, and so I kind of was bracing, am I gonna get hit again? That didn't happen. The next thing I heard was um, sirens immediately. There just so happened by God's sovereign you know, grace, that there was a fire truck at the gas station at the same intersection where the accident took place. So a whole team of first responders was there instantly. Mm -hmm. um, they pulled me from the car and set me up and we were in the, I was kind of in the median of the road, there was some grass and looked up and they were tending to me because I had just some 
um, cuts from, from what had happened. And they were worried about that and didn't want me to move. Obviously, they were trying to take care of me. But um, I looked up and saw Hadley directly in front of me uh, getting out of her car. And so Hadley, you know, and she, they brought her over to me. Realized, you know, we didn't know what was going on with Dobbs. And so we were just trying to figure out what, what is happening right now. Um, and we were asking, you know, how's Dobbs? And they, they were saying, He's fine, we're trying to get to him. Um, you know, we're trying to keep us calm. Pretty quickly, they took us to the hospital because Hadley was 36 weeks pregnant. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to check on Reed. There was a person there at the accident site that was saying, Dobbs is, Dobbs is all right, we're hearing his voice. Uh, he's gonna be okay, you guys go ahead, we're gonna take care of him. Really, they didn't know anything at that point. They were just trying to keep us calm. We were about two, two hours, two and a half hours into our drive um, when I got a phone call from my sister uh, that said, there's been an accident. I don't really know much more, um, but it's not good. So you guys probably should come back. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't have any other details. So we turned the car around, um, called to cancel our honeymoon, and started heading back. It was probably the longest drive of my life because we were waiting for a phone call and not knowing what happened. And in the ambulance, I remember, you know, we, we tried to stay hopeful and sing songs of, uh, we were singing It Is Well and just trying to uh, call out to God and pray through all of it. Um, but I remember when you started singing that song, I thought, I don't, I don't know if I like that. Because <laughs> this isn't the song that you sing when, this is what you sing when you're like, I don't like my life, what's happening, but I trust you, God. And uh, I remember thinking, like, I, don't, I don't know if this is the song I want to sing. One of the things that Hadley shared with me is before the accident happened, she looked in her river mirror and she said she felt like some, that, that God told her to tell Dobbs that she loved him. And I remember thinking, like, okay, sure, I can, like, why wouldn't I tell him I love him? So I turned back and I just rubbed his little foot and I said, I love you, buddy. And then the next thing I knew was just kind of a blur. I was bracing myself, spinning. I was, it was just very slow motion. While we were waiting, they were taking care of some of my wounds and I was just really hopeful that everything was all right. I was like, please, Lord, let everything be all right. And then I was in the, uh, ER waiting and my dad and mom came in and my dad came up to me and one of the first things he said was um, Dobbs is in the arms of Jesus um, and I just you know didn't want to hear that and I was so upset that that was what had happened um, and you know just I can't express what that feels like, it's just pain. Um, it wasn't something we had ever expected. We got to the hospital and it was the scariest walk of my life because I didn't know what we were walking into. I walked in and my sister Megan came out and met me and got me and took me back to the room where my parents and Gentry was. Moments before I got there, my dad had told Gentry that Dobbs had passed away. And Gentry was singing and praising God and crying. My parents were just holding him. But even in that moment, like, he knew who God was and that he had him. And he was praising him for that. My family was there, my sisters were there, and we just grieved together. Um, and then after a few minutes of that, um, they said, Hadley is um, asleep. She just had a C-section um, and she's gonna be coming back too. Um, 
Reed, our son, um, was born, um, but they had to kind of resuscitate him, but they've got him stable now, and you can go see him. But Hadley doesn't know about Dobbs yet, so, um, you know, what do you want to do? And they kind of talked to me about that, and so I said, I want to go um, be there for Hadley when she wakes up. Um, and so I went and saw Reed first, because we had a little bit of time, and I'll never forget when I got to see him, I, um, first of all, just kind of had to put Dobbs dying on hold <laughs> and just focus on Reed and just, I remember seeing his, you know, beautiful new body, but obviously just overwhelmed with adrenaline and all of this and going, um, hey buddy, you know, and just kind of saying hello and, um, you know, holding his little hand. And I remember he turned his, his head towards me and I was just like, oh wow, you know, he hears me. Um, and so I got to meet him for the first time. Uh, I remember waking up and first, um, I just remember looking at him and the first thing that I said was, how's Dobbs? And he said, um, he said, um, you know, sorry. <laughs> he said, our little boy's in the arms of Jesus. And, uh, I just remember, like you said, the pain um, and just sobbing and just saying no, like, th no, that's not what I want. She really looks back now and says that that was God's protection and grace over her because the last image she will ever have in her mind of that sweet, precious boy was her mommy telling her precious baby, I love you. In a race against time, the focus now shifted to saving baby Reed's life. The time frame of all of it is very blurry, but we had... Um, she was still recovering from a C-section. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to see Reed right away. Um, I had to do a little bit of recovery, but... I did get to go down and see him, and he was hooked up to lots of different machines, and um, we thought he was doing pretty well. I really hadn't, at that point, it hadn't thought, I hadn't thought like he's not gonna make it or anything bad, really. So well, they weren't saying anything yeah. was wrong with him. Mm -hmm. that they were monitoring him, but there wasn't any alarms. It right. just kind of seemed calm. Um, we did, I got to go see him, and I remember just um, rubbing his little arm, and he looked a lot like Dobbs. Um, so we got to spend some time with him. I remember resting in my hospital room and the doctors came in and he just said, so Reed is a little bit sicker than we thought. Um, he's got some bleeding on his brain and we don't think that it would be appropriate for us to operate on him. There are people in Chapel Hill that would do the best. So we think that it would be smart to have him airlifted out to Chapel Hill. That was the first time where I thought, wait, what? Reed's not okay? I thought. Like, and even then, I still thought, okay, well, they're gonna do the little surgery and he'll be fine. They said we need to get him there as soon as possible. So they had a helicopter come and pick Reed up. And within an hour, I got a phone call, a doctor at um, the hospital in Chapel Hill, and she just said, I think, um, I don't think Reed's gonna make it. We don't, we can't operate on him, um, it's too risky and we just think you and Gentry need to come as soon as possible. And there was another moment of just like, what? You know, no, this can't be happening. Not like both of them can't be gone. They had to call several different hospitals and places that had helicopters and they flew a helicopter out to us that would fly us to Chapel Hill so we could be there within the hour. And our families drove down, um, which was a couple hours trip. And I remember thinking, you know, just a couple days earlier, Dobbs and I were on the beach, and he loves helicopters. Mm -hmm. And we were watching helicopters from the beach, you know, how they sometimes fly over from military bases and whatnot. Um, and now here we are riding a helicopter. Dobbs is in heaven, and I'm riding a helicopter to say goodbye to my son Reed and just going, it was, it was just surreal. Mm -hmm. because we were going to spend time with, with Reed and those hours that we had with him when we got there, it was like, oh, you know, we, we got to hold him, but we, we knew we were having to say goodbye. 
it was it was hard, really hard mm-hmm. moments. Um, but we tried to cherish them the mm-hmm. best we could. Part of you wants it to go quickly. Part of you doesn't want it to end. Those moments mean so much because. With Reed, you know, that's pretty much all we have other than the pregnancy. With Dawes, we have all these moments to look back on, all these times and for the over two years, um, memories and fun things. But to look back with Reed and just know that even though so many of the moments are so tainted and just feel like we were robbed of, of raising him and, and making memories with him, we had these sweet moments of, of cuddling with him and skin-on-skin skin time and... Um, singing to him and um, and ultimately holding him while he took his last breath. We had when we got to the hospital. We actually he started to improve a little bit. Um, so there was kind of the question on what what do we do? Do we leave him on these machines? Is there a hope that he'll get better? Is it better to take him off? And so we kind of went through the back and forth hours and hours of that, sitting in the room by myself. I think Gentry had gone out for something really quickly and I was rocking Reed and I just said, Lord, I can't make this decision. I need you to make it for me. Like, you're gonna have to do it. And just a few moments later, the neurologist came in to do some tests on Reed and without going into, even having to go into too much depth, she just kind of looked at his eyes and examined him and just said, I'm so sorry. And you know, as painful as that was, I think, thank you God for making that decision, for not, for not giving us false hope that it might work out, you know, that he, he might make it, he might live. You know, when you're walking with people who are walking through grief, the best thing to do is not say a whole lot. You, you just speak words of love with your presence. Uh, Marilyn and I sat with them and just absorbed their grief with them. We wept as they wept, we cried as they cried. Um, We shared in their sufferings as they were going through the deep, dark night of the soul, as they walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And I don't think we said a whole lot uh, during that time period. I don't think you could say a whole lot. It's much like Job. Um, He had his friends come to him in his dire pain, and they started pontificating, trying to give reasons why it happened. And later, you know, Job said, I liked it better when you were just quiet. Mm -hmm. And I think God likes it better when we're just quiet and we speak His presence with our presence. Fatal car crash in Pender County left the community heartbroken. Taylor rear-ended Hadley's vehicle just after noon. Out into their car, killing their toddler and forced Hadley, who was eight months pregnant, into labor. The days that followed the tragedy would see an outpouring of love and support from all of Charlotte, and consequently the entire world. On a personal level, it became abundantly evident just how much their church and community loved them and grieved with them. Entry led uh, the worship team very much like a pastor, very much uh, like a father. So the uh, dynamic felt uh, like a family. Um, and Gentry was our dad. We had like a 6 a.m. call time, so it was early. But I walked in a little earlier than usual and just sat down and just didn't know what to expect from the team. I just sat there in peace and prayed, and and the team uh, walked in, and yes, and it was summer, but uh, I, 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 they were very, encouraging and like, hey, what can we do and how can we serve uh, the people of the church best in their absence? So it was like a dad moment, hey, we want to make Gentry very proud. I got the phone call um, from one of the pastors on our staff. And of course, for a split second, you're beyond shocked because you're trying to make sure that you've heard correctly. and unfortunately I had heard correctly. And really all I could do at that point was cry. So the pastor called me back and he said, can you go and fill in for Gentry this weekend? It would have been actually the next morning, Sunday morning. And I said, absolutely. And I had been away from Gentry's campus for almost two years at that point. And it was honestly like I never left. It was like I was still a part of that team, still a part of that family there. and was able to grieve with them and um, at the same time, you know, grieve with hope is what we always say. 
The mood that morning was sad. It very much so felt like one of our family members have died or both our family members. And it felt like it had happened to us directly. So much so that I broke down on that a Sunday morning between the first and second service because I was so hurt and I felt for our family. I don't recall us saying very much to each other past the hugs and walking through kind of the work that was before us. That Sunday morning, Pastor Chadwick would deliver the news to a tearful congregation and try to answer the question that so many asked. Why Gentry and Hadley? Let me begin by uh, answering that question, why? And, and again, that's the spiritual skeptic's greatest question to Christians. If your God is good, why do these bad things happen? It's a very broken world in which we live that um, the good news of God's love is probably greater than we think it is. The bad news of how broken this world is is probably worse than we think it is. You know, I divide the Bible into four different divisions. First of all, there's creation, Genesis 1 and 2. God created everything and it worked perfectly. Uh, Genesis 3, there was a rebellion against God that caused everything to fall. And everything in this world is negatively impacted by that fall. Uh, so what Gentry and Hadley went through with the loss of their two boys is the result of the fall. Uh, a man made a very stupid decision to ingest drugs. He made a very stupid decision to text while driving. And God doesn't intervene with our stupid decisions because if he does, then love can't operate. Since Hadley was a young mom, you can imagine the young moms in particular and her friends, even to a greater degree, were they were horrified for her, obviously, and grieving for her, but we're all human beings, and so you can imagine the next thing is, what if that happens to me? And there was almost like a panic. I noticed one, one morning the worship that we went to be part of at the, another campus, on one of our campuses, the young families especially were just horrified and saying, oh no, what if this happens to me? And I just remembered something that a missionary couple had said to me years ago that really helped me put some of those fears to rest because they had to deal with life and death all the time. My friend Grace said that her mother-in-law, who also had been on the mission field, same area, said to her one time, Grace, um, quit role playing tragedy because God will never give you, oddly enough, the word grace and never give you the grace you need unless you're actually going to go through it. So all I encourage people to do is obviously reach out to Hadley and Gentry and love on them and whatnot. But I did sort of strongly encourage them and warn them, don't role play this thing. Don't play it out in your mind like, what if this would happen to me? Because you can't. First of all, you can't imagine it. And secondly, God's not gonna give you the grace that you would need if you were going through it. Like he gives you the strength a two and the grace. I think um, um, Marilyn said it best, a two go through certain stuff like this. The strength comes from God. Um, and that it's not over until it's good. And, um, and that strength I saw in them that I still see is incredible. and something that I personally want. Anyone who heard the story stopped and said, wow, this is horrible. What is this couple going to do next? I think was their question, so everyone was watching. One week after the accident and the tragic loss of their children, during the memorial service of Dobbs and Reed, Gentry and Hadley Eddings would shock a world that was indeed watching to see what they would do next. The sanctuary was packed. Uh, it seats 1,900 people. There wasn't a seat available. It shows how many people truly loved them and how much their lives had touched other people. Well, I just remember driving through the parking lot, coming onto the property, and all the news trucks from every news station, not just local, but pretty far away. And so we just were immediately struck with the fact that this is a media story. The service itself glorified Jesus. That's what Gentry and Hadley wanted to make sure happened. They wanted it all to point to the resurrected Jesus and to make sure everyone left with the belief that they would see their two boys again, uh, that they believed they were not dead, but really alive in Jesus. I'll never forget the family came in and um, Sweet Hadley, her hands raised up high to the worship music, just worshiping. Um, no tear, 
just strength, just a, just a woman who loves the Lord and knows without a shadow of a doubt that he's going to make this right. But when Gentry got up and spoke, I think what touched so many of us was that he spoke with such sincerity, such warmth, such love, such hope, but also he spoke with a calm that had to be supernatural. It really was the peace that passes all understanding. No one could understand how he could sit, stand up and say what he said the way he said it. So they were just very strong and, and, and poised in how they just immediately took, took, the, um, took the pulpit, if you will, of that service. And Gentry's story, when he got up there to speak, was on forgiveness. Well, we had decided to forgive the driver. Um, you know, we realized it wasn't an intentional decision that he had made a mistake. Right. Uh, and it was something that we know that as Jesus has forgiven us, that he calls us to forgive others. Um, and, and I know for me, he's forgiven me a huge debt of the sins in my life. And I know that he, um, you know, I'm paying for that on the cross. That, that is just a significant uh, debt that he's forgiven for me and that I would have eternal life in him. That I want to be able to forgive others uh, too. And so uh, we prayed early on and said, Lord, uh, we, you know, God help me forgive the, the driver and, you know, and, and God, would you just care for him and his needs as he's walking through this too? Mm -hmm. I remember in the hospital room asking about him because I didn't really know anything. I just said, how was the driver? And at that point, we didn't know a lot of details, but I thought, I don't know if it were me who ran into the back of somebody and caused the lives of their two children to be taken, I would be devastated. I would be distraught. I don't know how you live with something like that. Um, I felt horrible for him and not being angry with him, just feeling, just feeling really, really sad for him. And then as we moved towards the memorial, um, we were sharing a, uh, an honoring of our sons, uh, some words. And as I was preparing to do that, I just felt prompted by the spirit to say a word about forgiveness. Um, and, and so I just encouraged everyone there to forgive anyone in their lives that had wronged them because God forgive, has forgiven us and so he calls us to forgive others. It had to be God that helped him make the choice to forgive the individual. The last thing that for me personally, I wanted to hear Gentry say was that he had forgiven this man. Um, I love that he did. I was so glad that he did. But as a friend, as someone who loves them and who's someone who's angry, um, it, it just made me rethink, like, wow, I want to go beat this guy. I want to find him and I want to hurt him like he's hurt my friends. And um, for Gentry, of all people, to put me in my place, it's just amazing. For a father who just lost both of his boys and the first thing he speaks on is forgiveness because that is what my father did for me. For Gentry to say, <clears throat> we're going to forgive this man because that's what Christ did for us. To bring himself, who I thought was always up here, down to what I thought was here. It was amazing to hear the response from the memorial about that uh, because you know, so many people were touched by that. And I remember neighbors saying, you know, my husband cheated on me, but I felt led to forgive him because of that. And on and on and on, just stories, people that were saying, you know, I was able to forgive right. because of that, that God really used that, um, right. that message. And like he said, it wasn't something that he had written out in his um, eulogy to honor Dobbs and Reed. It was like, mm -hmm. he just said, I felt prompted by the spirit to, to talk about forgiveness. There's definitely, Definitely healing and forgiveness. I can't imagine us walking through this pastime hanging on to that hurt. It's allowed us to take deep breaths in the hard moments and know that God's got it. And he's been before every detail and he's still before the details that are coming. Because it's not over. This is, a forever journey that 
we have to walk, you know? And with a few simple yet atomic words on forgiveness, Gentry and Hadley's ministry, the ministry of a two-year-old little boy, and the ministry of a precious departed infant were permanently cemented. The Edding story of forgiveness exploded. The news of their decision to forgive the driver of the vehicle that took the lives of their kids literally made its way around the world. Social media picked it up, People Magazine picked it up. I had friends from the West Coast that were texting me. Um, Even beyond the West Coast, we had international That's right, international uh, people were praying for us. us. That's right. And it went into the communities, it went into the public, it went in um, outside of America. I mean, it was all over. As the story of their public declaration of forgiveness caught on like wildfire on the heels of the memorial service, Gentry and Hadley entered what was perhaps the second biggest challenge of their entire ordeal, returning to their precious home and embarking on the inevitable and dreadful task of life without their boys. They decided to go home after we got back into town and they wanted to go home back to their house. Hadley had to come home to a house that was completely empty. Um, she had to come home to a nursery that she had set up for a baby who would never be in that nursery. Um, you know, as her friends, we were all like, what do we do? Do we go take everything and put it down? Don't let her see it. Um, but it was just a situation that we, we didn't know what to do or how to step in. So we just prayed and we prayed and we prayed. Um, when Hadley and Gentry did arrive home, they spent, you know, weeks in the house kind of alone. And we were, we were fearful of what that would look like, but they, walked into the hurt knowing that God was before them as he had been before in every other detail. Honestly, the first time I remember feeling like getting off of the roller coaster was just after the memorial service. You know, we had had time in the hospital. You know, we'd gone to my parents for a few days after the accident. We came home, we were planning a memorial service. We buried our children, we had the memorial service. And then it was like, we came home after that and it was just, okay, wait, like now we're in life again. And not, I mean, and everyone was still supporting us and there was still a lot going on outside. But that was, those were the first moments where it hit me just how difficult it was gonna be to walk through losing your children. Um, I don't know what they did in those moments. I know that it was very dark and very hard to even wake up in the morning. Um, I remember Hadley telling me, it's so quiet. It's just so quiet. And now having children and just knowing what the noise of a child is and then to extract that, um, that itself is very cold and a hard place to be. And obviously there's memories every corner, you know, of seeing Dobbs do this over here and we did this right here and we would, you know, take walks on the street and and he took off a lot of time from work, so that was good. We were home together, but I do remember just in those in those first days and weeks of of the quiet, um, feeling pretty desperate. Things just got really dark and really cloudy for quite some time. Um, I actually didn't get to speak to Hadley um, for a couple of weeks. Um, so of course, I had all these questions, like where was our friendship gonna go from here? Am I gonna be too painful to help her? Because we were supposed to be doing this together. My kids are here and her kids aren't. So what does that look like? I'll never forget, she finally got home, I could finally see her. And for a mom, we were mom friends. I mean, we were, we were doing this mom gig together and now I'm mom and she's not. And um, just the love that she walked in my house with that first time. She couldn't get her hands on my girls fast enough. <laughs> Ava was still a newborn. So she was, I don't know, almost um, t you know, a month or two, two months old at this point, and Hadley would come over and just go in her nursery and hug her and rock her and bathe her and change her diaper and just, 
And she would always say, Holly, you don't know how big of a blessing this is to me because my arms just ache for a baby. I'm just so great, grateful that God allowed me to, and her to still love each other and form the bond that we, that we did through that tragedy and that experience. And there were a lot of tears and there were a lot of prayers and there were a lot of just angry nights. Um, Hadley would call me so distraught some days that I couldn't even understand what she was saying. And I would just cry out like, Lord, equip me to be her friend. I don't even know what to do at this point, but I know that she's struggling and she's hurting and she's the last person on earth who should have to endure that. We committed really early on to reading scripture together in the morning as soon as we'd wake up. Because when you wake up in the morning, it all just hits you again. And we would read scripture before we'd go to sleep at night, just kind of giving ourselves that to lean on. The, the weeks to follow, the months to follow would um, would show that she would put on her brave face every time she walked out of the door. Um, she would try and smile and look happy. Um, and she did it very well. Um, people were so supportive and they wanted to love on her so much. But then there was also a sense of, I don't want to be Hadley today. I don't want to be sad. I really just want to be happy. I want, I want some normal emotions. Um, one of the things that I tried to do was just ride whatever wave she was on. If she was happy that day, I was happy. If she was sad that day, I was sad. Um, I, didn't, I just wanted her to feel validated in, in whatever it was or however it was she wanted to feel. In the wake of their darkest days, and as healing came painfully slow, Gentry and Hadley decided to honor the legacy of their children by repurposing the surplus of the GoFundMe campaign set up for them after the accident and use it to open an education center for impoverished children in the nation of Haiti. It's good to be with you this morning. And I just want to say uh, thank you for allowing us to name this school in your boy's honor. Um, and thank you for giving. We brought the plaque, that will, one like this, that will go on the school, the Dobbs and Reed Eddings Primary School. So we wanted to give this to you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. A lot of the money that was raised um, after the accident went towards uh, a donation to Mission of Hope. And with that, they were able to build a school um, uh, for children to have a, a meal uh, and a Christian education and learn about Jesus and grow. And, and um, it's, uh, to me, when I see that school, we got to go see it. It's up on a hill overlooking the ocean. Um, and it's just a beautiful school. And then it's filled with um, going on 400 plus children. Uh, that are being blessed, and it's called the Dobbs and Reed Edding School. Mm -hmm. um, and it's named in their honor. So the fact that God would use this tragedy to bless hundreds of kids year after year after year, day after day after day with food and education, to me, again, God didn't have to do that, mm -hmm. but that he, he would honor our sons in doing right. that. I'm, I'm so thankful right. that he did that. Yep. We say all the time that, you know, what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. Um, so Satan said, I'm going to destroy your family. And God said, well, I'm going to take your mess, Satan, and I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to let the legacy of these two little boys bring thousands and thousands and thousands of children to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you know. In the months that followed, Gentry would defiantly immerse himself in songwriting and in his ever-present desire to worship God with his talents. Gentry embarked on a project to record a CD of original songs and consequently to share them with his church family and anyone who'd attend the release concert when the recording was completed. He came back a few months later and was like, hey, and I want to do something and honor and of my sons and, and it was a music project. And, I said, hey man, I'm down. And so him, me, and Matt, and Matt was our an intern at the moment, and he had a studio. But we went to his studio and knocked out a lot of songs. And I could just see the joy on his face. And as we were 
doing that. What I did not know until the night of the concert, uh, uh, the CD release, was that all of the proceeds were going to uh, building a school and mission of hope in Haiti. And I thought that was the coolest thing that a century in Hadley did, because they didn't have to. two years after the accident, and Gentry and Hadley had stayed busy telling their story to countless people, sharing their story of forgiveness, and sharing the story of God's faithfulness. Little did they know that God was about to move them into a new season, an ultimate season of restoration. Gentry and Hadley were about to become parents again. <laughs> I remember the doctor actually addressing it with us, saying, you guys need to wait at least 18 months to try to have another baby and I'm like what are you talking about <laughs> like don't worry I'm not interested in that um, but as time went on um, I'd say around a year it started to get to a point where I was like you know I don't want to um, I don't want to not do that again Dobbs brought me so much joy the memories that I don't have with Reed that I wish I had you know the things that I can imagine that we would have done um, I want to be a mom. And like I said earlier, the only thing I've ever wanted to be is a wife and a mom. Um, so started kind of playing around with that idea again, like, okay, we can, we can do it. We, God made us to be parents, I think. You know, we, we want to love more children. Um, but just kind of trying to get past the idea that it was a betrayal or that it was moving on. Um, and leaving Dobbs and Reed behind um, was a struggle for a little while. And then, you know, it was just like one day I just felt like, you know, Dobbs and Reed would be happy if we came home and they were here and we said, guess what? You're going to be big brothers. They would be excited. So why wouldn't they be excited this time, you know? Well, today we get to let you know of another way that God has blessed Hadley and I. She is pregnant. show you a picture from the ultrasound. There's two babies. Well, we have two new sons. Um, they were born July 10th, 2017. Um, their names are Isaiah Dobbs Eddings and Amos Reed Eddings. So their middle names are after their big brothers. They are nine months old, and we are busy. <laughs> <laughs> the morning we were having the ultrasound, um, our first ultrasound was, um, you know, I had gone into Gentry's office to remind him that we were having it, and at that same time that morning, he had been a little bit sad because he was reading in Psalm, where it talks about, um, you know, children are a heritage from the Lord and you know you're blessed is the man whose quiver is full and he was saying that he just kind of felt a little bit sad about you know his quiver was not full and I said well I think we're gonna have twins you know kind of jokingly and I didn't I, believe her yeah I, I kind of had this feeling like maybe it's twins maybe it's twins so we get to the ultrasound and the ultrasound lady starts her thing and um, I remember looking at the screen in front of me and looking away because in my head I was thinking, don't be disappointed if there's not two, which is 
not my style at all. So anyway, she goes, oh, it's twins. So I, of course, like laugh and cry, and he's like, what? Yeah, I was in more of shock. Yeah, I uh, couldn't yeah. quite believe it. Hey, Ben. Everybody look at Hadley. All right, one, two, three, say Hadley's pregnant. <laughs> what? <laughs> Marilyn and I were in Missouri at one of our son's swim meets, and we were having lunch together, and my cell phone rings, and it's in my pocket, and I, I reach into it and, and, and take it out and, and look, and there's Gendry Eddings calling me. So I said, may I take this call? And Marilyn said, oh, sure, please. So I flipped it on, said, hi, Gentry, what's going on? And he said, well, Hadley and I are here, and uh, we just found out something we want to tell you, and we wanted you to be one of the first ones to know because you walked through this with us. And I said, sure, what is it? And he said, Hadley's pregnant. And I went, oh man, that is so wonderful. How cool is that news? That's just great, congratulations. He said, well, that's not the end of the story. He said, she's pregnant with two. <laughs> and I went, no, yes, twins, he said, are expected. And I went, oh man, Gentry, that's just unbelievable. That's Zechariah 9, 12, a double restoration of what you have lost. Since I was a little girl, I never had a dream of a career other than being a mom and a wife. So it's always been my dream to be mommy. And when that was taken away from me, it was pretty devastating. Um, but I always had that feeling like God was going to restore it. And, you know, God wants to give me the desires of my heart. And, and of course, being a mommy would be something that lines up with his, um, you know, his plan. So he, um, when I found that out, obviously I was in shock, but also just like, that's just like you, Lord. Like you have not failed to show up in one moment of this story. Um, you know, from giving us that first verse of be still and know that I am God that carries us all the way through to having a school opened in Dobbs and Reed's name and, um, you know, so many other things and then finding out we're having twins and then even later finding out they're boys. Um, it's just like, he's showing off. Yeah, he's, he's refilled my quiver. Uh, you know, I, I like to remind myself I have four sons and just thinking, you know, Dobbs, Reed, Isaiah and Amos and I uh, trust, Dobbs and Reed into God's care now, and my job now is to care for Isaiah and Amos. Yes, we had um, this blanket made um, out of some of Dobbs' clothes and his sheets and his bedspread. Um, so it's just it's great little memories. And sometimes they play on it, sometimes we cover up in it. Um, but it's just clothes that we have, like, you know, a lot of memories of him wearing. I think early on we thought um, Isaiah would be a little bit more laid back and Amos was going to be rambunctious. But then um, more recently, Isaiah has been, you know, he came out first. He's, he's been showing some signs that he's going to be the ringleader. Yeah, we think he's the leader of the pack. Yeah. But they both, personality wise, they're both pretty laid back. Um, they're usually happy unless, you know, the witching hour five to seven. Dobbs and Reed will never, ever be replaced, ever but they're big brothers now, and that's so exciting. Amos and Isaiah have been such a gift and such an added, welcomed addition to our family. God's timing is perfect. We'll have traditions over the years of going on, um, you know, Dobbs and Reed's Heaven Day and on their birthday to, you know, the graveside. And one of the things that we're gonna do is read 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, which tells us all about the, our hope in Jesus Christ, that He died on the cross for our forgiveness. He rose again on the third day. Uh, and we speak that at that moment to remind ourselves of our resurrection hope. And so they'll know they had two brothers and that they're in heaven and that in Jesus we have resurrection hope. And so they'll grow up hearing that story, not just at church, but you know, tangibly right as part of our story as a family as they think about their brothers. I think too, something that's really important to me is that they know that they're a part of this story. You know, they're a huge part of the story, really. Um, they had two brothers that they don't have the privilege of knowing on earth, that they will know one day. Um, 
and they are kind of the redemption side of that story. You know, look what God did. He brought you to show the world, to continue to show the world how powerful and how loving and how mighty He is. And um, you know, Dobbs and Reed took that first act, you know, of of look what God can do through something terrible, and you get this redemption part where you're like, wow, look how loving God is and what He would do for this family who has lost so much. On this side of the tragedy, and in this season of restoration, Gentry and Hadley see the blessing of being parents to twin boys as a symbolic miracle, a statement from heaven itself. It's just like God. Yeah. You know, in our story, He's been showing up left and yeah. right. And so this is just God going, wow. Yeah. Look at how, you know, amazing I, I care for you guys and want to. Yeah. Just to, and for me, it was like another way of like just putting his stamp on it like, hey, Satan, you're not going to ruin this family. And you tried, and we're going to do something good out of what seems like the most tragic thing on the planet. Um, we're going to bring many people to the Lord, and we're going to do a lot of good things through their death, and I'm going to restore to them two sons. So, you know, for me, it kind of felt like, just stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. We still run into people all the time, mm -hmm. uh, in person, on the phone, and email, who just stop us and they'll say, you don't know, we were praying for you, and I went through this, or I went through that, and your story was an encouragement to me, uh, gave me hope, gave me encouragement, and I just have to, I stop and go, thank you, God, because I know that I'm just human. It's, you know, it's just God working through us to do something incredible to encourage lots of people, uh, and I'm humbled and grateful that he would use our family right. for, for that. Yeah, people always say, you're so strong. I'm like, oh, no, not really. <laughs> I don't feel strong. I think God makes me look strong, apparently. Yeah, what I would like people to know is that God is good, that he loves us, that he cares for us, and that he proves that and demonstrates it in Jesus Christ, who is our hope, who is our savior. Uh, and no matter what we go through, no matter how hard it is, even in the face of death, there is hope in Jesus' name. Uh, because He came, He died for our forgiveness, and He rose again on the third day. And that is a truth that's unshakable, that has gotten, that's been our foundation, and it can be anyone's foundation, no matter what you go through, no matter how hard, dark it is. Ultimately, for everyone who suffered the loss of the Eddings children, there is one hope which rings eternal. Death is not the end. For theirs is not a story about tragedy. Theirs is a story of faith, courage, forgiveness, and God's unwavering faithfulness and restoration. For the norm, most people probably aren't as like heaven come as we are, <laughs> unless they've had a, you know, a similar tragedy or you know, they are ready to go. Um, so definitely, I think since May 23rd, 2015, we've said, okay, we're ready, Lord. I am thankful that God would give me joy while I'm still here waiting. Um, for his return or to go to heaven. Um, I certainly don't want to leave my boys because I don't want them to have to deal with any kind of tragedy like that. But, um, you know, we're ready <laughs> when he is because I'm ready for my whole family to be together. For me, I think before the accident, home was here. My family's here, my children are here. But now with Dobbs and Reed in heaven and just thinking through all this, heaven is for sure the home. This is, this is our temporary home, and I think I feel that more, I know that more, and I get excited thinking about that eternal resting place in a different way than I did before. I tell Hadley this all the time, please, I want to be on the front line to see you and Gentry's face when you get to see Dobbs and Reed again, um, because I've watched all of the horrid of what happened and um, what Satan tried to do, and I just cannot wait for that homecoming, for that final, this is it, well done, good and faithful servants that you are, here are your other two boys. And we will never, no one will ever take them from you again. This is final. <laughs>